Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's lunch hour lecture. My name is Jack Ashby from the Grant Museum of Zoology. I'm here to host today's talk and to welcome our speaker, Kate Jones, who is Professor of Ecology and Biodiversity jointly at the Centre for Biodiversity and Environmental Research here at UCL and also at Zoological Society of London, as well as chairing the Bat Conservation Trust. Kate's research focuses on a number of biodiversity issues including the interactions between past and present evolutionary patterns, bat diversification and extinction, um, zoonotic diseases, engaging citizen scientists, and also developing new monitoring technologies for nature, which places her perfectly to give today's talk, Technology for Nature. If you could join me in welcoming Professor Kate James. So thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to come to do a lunch hour lecture. It's really exciting uh, to be here. Um, so I'm uh, you know, fully aware that technological advances have you know, undoubtedly contributed to the loss of biodiversity and the loss of services which go with biodiversity. Um, but I'd like to try and convince you today, this afternoon, that... Uh, the new technologies that we're, that we're seeing coming, uh, coming along can actually help us uh, understand better uh, how biodiversity is declining and then try to predict what the impacts of climate change and anthrop other anthropogenic changes are going to be so we can mitigate that loss. But also uh, trying to see how we can engage people in, uh, in nature and the environment around them and I, I hope to convince you that I think that the, these new technologies will be able to do that. So uh, I hope that all of you know that we're in the midst of a mass extinction crisis as uh, humans use more of the resources on the planet and we have declines of populations across the board uh, also uh, and declines of habitats. So the, the extinction is so alarming that in in 2002, uh, the uh, parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity got together uh, to make this big aim for 2010, which was to uh, significant reduction to, to, to um, achieve a significant reduction of the current rate of biodiversity loss at global, regional, and national levels. So that's um, eight years. So it's quite quite ambitious aim. So how did we do? So I've put together this like dashboard for biodiversity. So uh, I've cut it up into the state of biodiversity, uh, the pressures that their fa uh, biodiversity is facing, uh, response, and the benefits that we get from biodiversity. So think of this um, as a kind of trading screen, so you can kind of see how how good things are going. So um, this is not a depressing talk, but this is a depressing slide. So um, overall, the state of biodiversity is pretty bad. So these are indicators that we are using to kind of measure that. So if I, I don't have anything to point to, to, oh, the mouse, how exciting. The, this one up here is called the Living Planet Index, uh, which is one that's run by uh, WWF, Wildlife Fund for Nature and for Zoological Society of London, which is showing a population decline across the planet. Um, so the, the, there are other indicators there, like farmland birds, which is that one. Up, oh, it's disappeared now. OK, well, that was short-lived. Uh, <laughs> so um, the benefits, the, the pressures that are on biodiversity are also increasing. So the proportion of fish stocks, which are um, overexploited, uh, the number of invasives, the number of alien species is also increasing. The climate, climate is also changing. Uh, this is down the bottom here. But, um, and the benefits that we're getting f from biodiversity is also declining. So these are um, the LPI, Living Planet Index, but just for species which are utilised, which are also declining. Um, so, you know, on the, on the kind of positive note, uh, we're, we're doing more about it than we were. So the responses are also increasing to, to try to mitigate some of these pressures and the, and the state of biodiversity. But if that was a bit abstract for you, I'll just bring it into focus. And these are four species which are, uh, their numbers are actually figuring in the tens, not tens of thousands, in their tens. 
So this is uh, one of my favourite species, the kakapo, which is the most stupidest green parrot that you've ever seen, about this big. Uh, and it's ground dwelling in New Zealand. The awesomeness, which is the giant salamander. And maybe we can have the, the, the lights down a bit? No? <laughs> no, okay, fine. <laughs> and then the Javan rhino, which has got um, very few individuals left. And this one is uh, the, um, the Chinese river dolphin, which was last seen in 2004. So this isn't just a bunch of figures. This is species going extinct. Um, so why is that important? Well, um, apart from its intrinsic value, which is, is also, you know, is a very important aspect of biodiversity loss, but um, a lot of... Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> Lots of energy is being put into thinking about what the effects are of biodiversity declining. So uh, a number of publications have come out recently, and this is just a, a kind of a schematic from one of the latest ones, which is the National Ecosystem Assessment in 2011. So this kind of shows you um, or illustrates how you can have biodiversity here on the right-hand side, and then the goods and services like pollination or water quality or disease regulation are coming from uh, those, that biodiversity, the ecosystem services of that biodiversity, and that fits into and that affects human well-being. And then anything that affects that uh, kind of cycles around to affect the biodiversity, which then affects human well-being. So this is just one of the many of these, um, of these, uh, these uh, conceptual frameworks which have been developed. Uh, the first one was in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005. And then this one is a very important um, publication, the TEEB publication, the Economics um, of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. And then this ending with the one which kind of assessed all of the UK. So this was a little bit controversial. Um, George Monbiot, uh, in particular, attacked this kind of approach of valuing nature, thinking that if you valued nature, you were somehow devaluing it and opening it up to being sold off. But personally, I think this is a very important approach in where you can talk to policymakers about the value of biodiversity in nature. So given the importance of biodiversity, it's a real surprise that we don't model it better. So if you think about the IPCC, which is in the news recently for bringing out their latest report, they have these models uh, not just one set of people, but they coordinate all of the models across the planet from researchers in different groups. We don't have anything like that for biodiversity. Um, one of the main reasons is that um, the IPCC used data from weather stations, which are perhaps less than a kilometre away from us as we're sitting here. So there are these stations across the world recording and measuring weather and the... Um, and, and rain and, and, um, and sunlight, but there's nothing like that for biodiversity. So if we really want to get serious about modeling what biodiversity is going to do and the kind of ecosystem services that come from biodiversity, then we need to, to, to rapidly ramp up the information that we've, we're getting that, are, that we need. So um, if you think about those old Victorian naturalists, they spent their time collecting lots and lots of specimens, putting them in museums. And this is an image from um, a really exciting new project at the Natural History Museum called Ice Specimen. So they are trying to photograph all of their specimens. Yes, all of their specimens. So there's billions of them. So they're starting off with the butterflies of the UK, butterflies and moths of the UK. And this is one of their slides that they're taking pictures of. So this just is illustrating that you know, historically, we used to document these very carefully and uh, measure, you know, kind of put them in trays and take pictures. Um, so now, you know, this has moved on slightly so that we, we have organisations like the, the British Trust for Ornithology or Butterfly Conservation Trust who engage volunteers to go out in these citizen science projects and monitor wildlife. So it's a bit better than a recording uh, you know, just capturing things and putting them in a museum. So now we're actually monitoring in a small way using volunteers. And, but it's very patchy um, across the world. So there's only some countries that have programs that do this. So we really need to, to ramp up um, our monitoring of nature. 
And um, I think that these new technological advances will be able to help us do that. So I'm just going to go through a few, the really some of the few things which have excited me recently when I've been looking into this. So um, one of these things is, is camera traps. So camera traps have been used for 100 years, uh, mostly for hunters to kind of find prey in the woods. But more recently, they've been adopted by the wildlife conservation kind of societies and, and, the, um, and the research areas to try to track wildlife in the natural environment. And this is an image which is taken in Liberia a couple of years ago. Um, so they set these camera traps out in a grid across uh, this forest in Liberia, uh, not, not knowing what they would catch, and a pygmy hippo uh, happened to come into their frame and got caught on camera. Now, py pygmy hippos hadn't been found in Liberia for many, many, many years, and this was a really exciting event that the president got really behind and set that reserve area as a, as a nature reserve. So um, the power of these images is, 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 is very great and can engage people in different ways than we, we, we were used to before. So these cameras are now a little bit more uh, sophisticated. So they have, some of them have um, cell phone or satellite, uh, satellite, um, satellite receivers in them so that they can send data up to servers held elsewhere. So this is an example from Zoological Society of London. Uh, they have this program called Instant Wild, and they have uh, sets of camera, grids of cameras, all around in their nature reserves that they, they hold, or their partners are working, where they're working with partners in different places. And these images, uh, these cameras take images, and these images are then beamed back to uh, servers we hold in London, but then anyone can access those and, and help us identify what's in there. So this is opening up different worlds and different, different wildlife to people that haven't seen these things or don't have any opportunity to do that. So it's not just a terrestrial realm. This is um, an example from one of my PhD students, Dave Kurenik, uh, and he is trying to see whether he can use cameras underwater to monitor marine protected areas. So these are new protected areas which have been set up in the marine realm. And instead of uh, how we usually monitor them, which is fishing, uh, he's trying to see whether he can create uh, new ways to monitor things with, um, with, with images and video. So this is a video that, that, that was taken in the Chagos Nature Reserve in the uh, South Pacific. So not just with cameras, but with other kind of sensors uh, has the kind of field expanded. So these uh, can be very small, tiny tags that you put on animals. They can go on their collars or be glued temporarily to their skin with a non-harmful uh, glue that comes off, that can be groomed off. Um, so these can be a range of sizes. And I've given you an illustration here of something that you may have seen recently on the BBC, which is the secret lives of cats. So they put these tags on the cats, and they also had a camera on them. And uh, the village in, I think it was Oxfordshire, uh, set these cats, uh, they were just the normal house cats, their normal house cats. And uh, of course, the owners were completely convinced that their cat didn't um, actually go anywhere all day, <laughs> just stayed in on the sofa and then saw them in the morning. But actually, um, as you can see from here, this is some of the routes which um, the cats were taking. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, some of the routes the cats were taking um, in one evening. So uh, the, this was really kind of opening people's eyes to um, you know, <laughs> what the cats were doing while they weren't looking. So another kind of example is, is um, these daily diary tags, which are not just recording GPS, but they're actually recording up and down movement and side to side movement. So this is called an accelerometer. So if, if you guys have a phone and you're playing, of course, obviously you wouldn't be playing phone, uh, games on your phone, you're using it for email and work. But if you were playing a game on your phone, then if you tilt, if you do tilting or anything like that, then there's an accelerometer in here which is recording that tilting. That's exactly what's in these, uh, these tags on these animals. And so, as you can see from the graph here, this is showing you in three dimensions what the animal is doing. 
So you can actually use different techniques to um, col colorate, um, to, to look at, to associate the actual um, data that's coming from these tags to behaviours. So this is revolutionising how we understand how animals behave because you're getting all this information from these tags. So th this is some, an, a huge area that's growing and uh, you can actually look at the movement of animals. So this is the uh, annual movement of the Manx Shearwater uh, down to South America and back again up to the Northern Hemisphere and it's actually following the annual movement of chlorophyll across the planet. So this is trying to link animal behaviour to environmental uh, variability across the planet. So this is a a project by Robin Freeman, who's at, at uh, UCL and Zoological Society of London. So this is one of his projects using a new tag that he's developed called Mataki. So if you're interested, look up Mataki tags. So he's got a few projects now, and he's collaborating on many more. So I've been interested in developing sensors for acoustics, so um, using the sounds that animals make to track them. So trying to develop monitoring programs using sound. And I've got particular interest in bats, that anyone knows me will know that. Um, so I've been using the ultrasonic sounds that bats make to track them, because they leak information about themselves into the environment. And as they use this for location and for navigation, they use it all the time at night when they're trying to get about. So it makes it a really useful um, thing that they do, which you can then track and track populations. So in 2005, uh, we set up the first acoustic uh, global program on monitoring bat on, on bats. And of course, uh, we started that in Transylvania, in Romania, because where else would you start a national bat monitoring program, international bat monitoring program? So um, our, our idea was to, um, to train local people and regional groups uh, to, to understand what bats were doing and how they echolocated and how to use the equipment and how to analyze the data. So we provided tools for local groups who were then empowered to do their own thing, you know, ask their own questions of the data, which I think is a, it's a good model for how to do conservation projects in other countries. Um, so we had um, a lot of fun, and um, we did a kind of reverse Genghis Khan move back to, through Mongolia to Japan. Uh, so we, we uh, made a lot of friends during that and set up a lot of um, monitoring programs along the way. So the Japanese really like it. They, they love gadgets. So um, I'm not making generalised statements, hopefully, but they, they do love this project. So what, what the actual technique is that we put a detector, an acoustic detector, on top of a car, and we get them to drive around and set transects. So it means that um, you are monitoring uh, a, one particular habitat in the same way across huge, huge areas, which makes you able to uh, standardise all the methods across the whole continent. Um, so it's actually quite tr tricky to put all of this equipment together and explain it in different languages. So we came up with an, an iPhone app which would enable, or could be downloaded and then you can plug the microphone, the acoustic microphone, into it and it would translate all of those sounds and record that and upload that to our website. So we were trying to streamline the collection of data, and that's worked very well. So um, we have iPhones or Android uh, phones to uh, collect data that by plugging in an acoustic detector into them. So uh, that was a few years ago now, and since then there's a huge growth in this area in, 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 in smartphone monitoring apps. So now we've got the iBats one, but there's also a ladybird one if you want to, if you can spot ladybirds, you, you want to record them. Ash Tag app is a, it's a really interesting example. So uh, when the uh, disease, the ash dieback disease was found in this country, within four days, I think it was, someone, some enterprising person had made an app for uh, release onto the iPhone and to the Android so that anyone who fi finds a a diseased um, ash can report it back to DEFRA. So that was launched within a few days of it actually being found in this country, which I think is amazing. So you, you have um, a kind of evolution of these apps now. So instead of just having them for monitoring, 
you can actually have these keys and identifications on the phone. So instead of having these books you carry out in the field, you just carry out your iPhone and, uh, or, smart, or whatever smartphone you want. And it can give you the identifications in the field by using interactive keys. So um, uh, interesting ones are the FSC, the Field Study Centre guides, and they have different, type, uh, different animals um, and plants um, that you can download as separate little uh, add-ons. And a really interesting one is called NatureGate, which is just here. Um, so NatureGate has the keys, but also links you together. So if you've met, you found something and you've identified it with the key, you can tell your neighbour, and then you have a map up of where everybody's found everything. So it's, it's really a really interesting kind of take. So using the phone not just for its recording and being able to take it in the field, but to communicate with each other and to set up networks of identifications and, and sightings. Um, so this idea that you can take something in the field and it would help you identify the species is a very powerful one. So firstly, for, for monitoring, it's, it, it increases the validity of the data that you're collecting. So monitoring biodiversity is really important. But um, also it kind of engages you in, in, this, in your environment as never before. So this idea of identifying things in the field is a very powerful one. And you know, it's a very exciting thing to be able to do. But we're not very good at it. <laughs> so we've got these guides and these ID things which people take out. But what people really want is to just to point something, a phone at something it, 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 and to be told what it is. So wouldn't that be amazing? So we're not there yet, but I'm going to give you a few examples of how this is going. So this is iSpot, which is one of my favorite websites ever. Um, so if you are in the field and you've got the iSpot app, you can take a picture if you're not sure what it is, and you can upload it to the iSpot website. And behind this iSpot website are thousands of people who are specialists in identifying different types of nature. And you get a little badge if you're good at bats or birds or, or um, butterflies. So you can increase in um, expertise. And then you can offer an identification of this image. So then um, I was seeing some stats from the, the guy that runs this, Jonathan Silvertown. And he was saying within half an hour, most of them are actually identified, which is crazy. Um, so uh, that's a really good way. So you're actually getting the crowd to identify your species that you've been finding in the field, which is a really good way of doing it. But still, it's not instant. It's not that instant thing that we, we might be wanting. So other ways, other developments of this are to try to uh, develop algorithms which will do it instantaneously. And so this is the idea behind the Zooniverse website. So if you haven't had a look at this, you should do, you should log on and have a look. So it was started by a bunch of astronomers to start with because they're getting petabytes of data every half an hour from the Kepler space, well, they were from the Kepler space field. So they're getting these images of these galaxies and they needed help, your help, to actually classify them. So we're very good at, at some of these um, classification tasks and they wanted to train our train computers to do, to do it in the same way. So they have these uh, Galaxy Zoo, which is really cool, and then this one, which is another one of my favorite ones, which is um, Ships Live. So what happens is that you uh, go and become a ship's captain, and you help them um, digitize all of the ship's logs which they've been getting over the last few centuries. And the reason they're doing it is because our climate models are based on terrestrial recordings and they're missing a load of sea recordings. And these guys, centuries ago, recorded the, t the time, the date, and the weather that was happening at that point, which really helps to increase the validity of their models. So you're actually helping with, with science. You don't have to be an expert to be engaged in these things. So of course, Zooniverse have gotten into nature in a big way. Um, so there are a number of different projects that, if you're interested, you can go and have a look at. Go wild in Serengeti, which is... Uh, Seren snapshot Serengeti, you can um, identify things in, in images like zebra and, and help them out with their uh, masses of recordings that they've got. Of course, I have one, which is called Bat Detective. What else would it be? <laughs> so here, you become a bat detective. And uh, as 
as I was telling you about before, we've got all of these data from iBats. We've been recording there since 2006, and each file is a gigabyte. Uh, and it's an hour and a half, 90 minutes, and we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of these uh, recordings. And we need help to be, to be able to find those back calls in those recordings in a really easy way. So we set up this site. These are all my collaborators, mostly my students and postdocs and other collaborators at UCL and, and other places. Uh, and you select, uh, you find a recording and you select it and then tell us the kind of sequence of calls and you can listen to it online. So log in, have a, have a go, you can, you can play the recording as well. Um, and then we've got a kind of active Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it accounts. So this is a kind of social enterprise. So my student Kim has been um, bravely manning the uh, social media networks to kind of encourage people and answer people's questions. So it's a, a real kind of community project to try to classify or get an automatic classifier to be able to do this automatically. So what am I talking about? Well, this is an example of a, a kind of echolocation call from the back. So I want to be able to tell the difference between this That thing at the end, which is called a feeding buzz, when it gets closer and closer to the insect, it needs more information about it. So I want to be able to tell that from the feeding buzz. And then also I want to be able to tell the social So they're singing to each other, so they're trying to attract each other and take each other. We have these songs. So we're doing quite well, actually, with um, our... our um, engagement with people. So we, we launched it uh, last year, but we've had over 2,000 people uh, go onto the site, and one person's done over 40, nearly 43,000 classifications on their own. <laughs> Thank you very much to whoever that is. <laughs> um, so I know what the burning question is on your lips. You know, I know that you can't contain yourself, but you, you want to know what bat it was. You know, so that's the key question, OK? We know social calls from feeding buzzes or from echolocation calls, but what bat it, what was it? So this is something which has been puzzling me for a while now. Uh, so how can we tell the difference between these calls? And bats range in, in echolocation frequencies from 6 kilohertz to over 212. So that's, that's a crazy amount of variation. And they have all kinds of different shapes and, and sounds. So can we develop something? Well, we started off with... European species, so I've kind of grouped them into different call shapes here on the left-hand side, uh, and they correspond to the different kinds of species of bats on the top. And, and this gives you a kind of percentage correct figure. So what we did was we took a slightly different approach than bat detective. We uh, got together a group of people um, in a kind of echo bank called Echo Bank, Echo Bank Consortium, and we asked them to actually send us the things they were really sure about. So a library, a really good library of calls that they were really sure that these were from this species. And then trained an artificial neural network to identify these. So we were just making algorithms which you could then use to automatically detect what species they were. So this is kind of showing you what our success was. So we've got pretty good success apart from these blighters here, which are myotis calls. And if anyone knows anything about European bats or UK bats, these are very, very difficult to identify because they all look like this. <laughs> they all look exactly the same. So um, what we're doing now is with students and collaborators here at UCL, we're trying to figure out how best to recognize back calls. So we're using some technologies from uh, voice recognition software from humans. So humans are obviously only one species. Uh, so we need to think about how to adapt that to uh, a whole set of species. So what we are working towards then is an automatic identifier for your phone. So you'd be able to plug in a bat, acoustic bat detector. So these phones uh, are adapted to human hearing, so they can't hear ultrasonic, so you'd have to plug something in. So we're working on a kind of cheap version of a detector. And then uh, you'd be... I, I've just drew this out because we actually haven't finished it yet. <laughs> so uh, the, the thing would come in, the sound would come in, and it would record it on the phone and then deploy these, um, these algorithms that we're getting from Bat Detective and from the ones we've developed for the Species ID 
uh, and give you a, an identification on the phone while, while you're out in the field with the, with the detector in the phone. So that, if you want to know more about the project, we've got it here. Uh, so that's ongoing. But I guess um, we aren't alone in this. So uh, really exciting developments have been the evolution of these apps into apps which you can do automatic identification on your phone. So I talked to before about these keys, but this one called Leaf Snap, you can take a picture of a leaf, put it in front of you, and it will tell you, it will use the same kind of methods I've just described to you, but for leaves, and it will give you an ID. So at the moment it's for North America, but um, I saw someone at the museum, Natural History Museum, a few weeks ago who was developing one for the UK. So that would be really, that'd be really exciting. This one is, is really awesome. It's called Cicada Hunt. So it was developed by some guys down in Southampton. Um, they take a, they listen for a small um, section of sound and they analyze those calls. Same thing as the, as the bats, but because cicadas uh, make noises down uh, in lower frequencies, you can use the phone. And then it tells you if there's a cicada present. So this is for um, an endangered cicada in, in the new forest. And so people aimed, uh, armed with this app can go out and, uh, and, find, and find these calls, find these species. So I guess just to finish then, um, where is this heading? Well, I don't know, but I think it's very exciting. Uh, so there are new products coming on all the time. So there's an app called Google Goggles. I don't know whether anyone's seen this, but you can hold it up. It's on your phone. It's part of the Google package. I don't work for Google. Um, <laughs> you hold it up, and it can identify things in that viewfinder, and it will find the web page that it's associated with. Uh, this is not a real picture, by the way, but this is Google Glass. So this is, you know, this is an augmented reality app which feeds information into your glasses as you're looking out of them. So we're just starting to develop some augmented reality biodiversity apps as we speak. So this was emailed to me this morning uh, from my collaborator at Microsoft, who's Gareth Russell. He also works at NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, so he has got... Uh, a recognition system which he can hold up and it will recognize that there's a tree there and it will work out how much oxygen it's using. So the bigger the, the column, the more oxygen it's using up or it, the, the rate of oxygen transfer is, is higher. And I, I said to him that nobody would believe that this was actually working. So I got him to take a picture of him doing it. <laughs> I suppose if someone else taking a picture of him doing it, which is this here. So he's just looking out from the Microsoft building in Cambridge this morning and uh, telling, you know, to, to show you. So you can just imagine the power of this, you know, that you could have automatic, automatic recognition things on these devices. And you, so you could just imagine walking, walking into a woodland and having these things being fed into your visor or on your phone and really, really engaging you within that environment. And that's what the image I want to leave you with, walking around this forest with these identification tools to really engage you and children and everyone into this world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. That was really fascinating. We do have some time for questions. If you do have a question, just wait for the microphone so people watching online can hear you. There's one coming behind you. Uh, hi. Hi, Kate. Really fascinating talk. Thanks very much. Um, I'm from the Giordano Institute at UCL, and we're going to be running a National Environmental Crime Conference on the 27th of November, which is all about using technology um, to help biodiversity, like wildlife poaching and waste crimes. Right. Um, so really, really interesting. Um, one of the questions that ties in with all of this is that it's great we've got all of these new technologies, but all of this generates large amounts of data. Yeah. Um, so the question is, would you perceive this as a new challenge, and what can we do to kind of analyse this data, and what will be the new steps, the next steps, to kind of deal with this sort of problem? Um, I think that's a really good point. And um, I guess I see technology as not just these sensors, but the tools as well. So the bat thing I showed you is a, is a kind of new technology in the way that it analyzes all these data and can go through the recording. So I would say that 
I mean technology in terms of the tools. So I agree with you. I think it's incredibly important. And I think that biodiversity uh, scientists have been moaning for years that we don't have enough data and we've got IPCC jealousy. But now we've got all this data and we don't know what to do with it. So I think the challenge is massive. And it's not just for us as biodiversity scientists, you know, we don't really know very much about computer vision or machine learning. It's actually a challenge for them as well because they don't know how to handle these data too because the algorithms have been focused on telling a Coke can from a Pepsi can, you know, not a tiger from a lion or two tigers from each other. So I think we are getting into this, this place where we're challenging them as well as challenging ourselves. So um, not to do a plug, but um, this is a kind of consortium that I've set up, Technology for Nature. It's got a website. It's with Microsoft, with Zoological Society of London, uh, with UCL. And basically what we're trying to do is to get those machine learning people, the, com the computer vision people together with us to figure out some of these problems. There's a question just right in front of you. Are you there? Kate, um, do you know, are schools getting interested in this? Because uh, with physics and CERN, they, they've been involved at secondary level. But it seems to me something that primary school kids could be involved in. Absolutely. Um, I think the Zooniverse have a, a really big outreach team, which go in. It's called Zoo Teach. Obviously. <laughs> so they go into schools and they, they kind of do some of the physics curriculum with the bat stuff because you know it's all about sound and how you image sound and there's loads of other things that they do with with schools but i think this could be so bit much bigger you know and um gareth's um gareth's intention for doing this at, when he started doing this was for a school kind of outreach project so you could really see what trees you had and what they were doing and what ecosystem services how important they were for the environment so I think I, now that I'm collaborating with them, I've got all these bigger plans. So I don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> There's a question at the very top in the box. Um, I can see by the last question and answer that it obviously changes human philosophical concepts for the survival of animals and, and, and generally that. But does it help the, um, say, the bats and things, does it help their survival strategies? And would it help with larger animals like rhinos and stuff like that? Um, I really do think it does. So this link between uh, using these technologies to, to augment monitoring projects and engage people in monitoring projects, I think is a really powerful concept. And that... You, know, you don't need to know anything about bats to take part. And I think that's a really valuable thing. You can have a, a tool which kind of opens up this whole new world to people. And I think that, that's the value of it. And just to take your point about rhinos, um, Zoological Society of London have just got a big project from Google to develop devices which um, are kind of activated. They activate drones so that they're actually tracking poachers. So I think... Um, although there are lots of negatives about technology, we're trying to think about how best to use it. And I think it's a very exciting time for conservation at the moment. We probably have time for one more question, if there is one. I'm going to ask one, if that's all right. Is, <laughs> there, was there one out there? Ah, yeah, sorry, <coughs> go for it. Possibly a naive question. I wonder about funding this sort of thing for the future and where it's coming from when we're all so hard-pressed economically? Uh, so the question was about funding, where the funding uh, would come from, given that uh, of the environment that we're in at the moment. Um, I think, uh, in a way, it's a, a kind of cost-saving measure that you're doing it this way because you're automating a lot of the approaches and so that all the citizen power that was out collecting these data manually is being kind of replaced by some of these automatic sensors. Not to um, lower the value of that or anything, but it's a kind of a cheaper approach. So I think in some ways there are lots of cost savings. In other ways, a lot of these, these things are being developed for these uh, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, tools as we speak. And so a huge amount of money is going into um, classifying things that you're seeing around you. And so I think there, are, there is money and opportunities for that. And we, we got a grant 
just recently from APSERC, which is one of the, the UK Engineering Council, Research Councils, to kind of to do this for biodiversity. And this is where some of the, the money for this is coming from. Okay, that is all we've got time for. I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. But most of all, thank you to Professor Kate James. <laughs>